Jesus? Is that possible? And if so, what does that mean for us? Let's talk about it with Jared Wilson on Steve Brown. He's, he's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here that you would take time from your busy day or evening or morning and spend it with us is a high and holy compliment and a compliment to you about your taste, about what your proclivities are. You're probably as weird as we are. At any rate, we're glad you're here. If in case you were wondering, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter, our executive producer, is here. He's the type of friend you would probably call to get bailed out of jail. <laughs> I would do that. <laughs> I would do that for anyone. <laughs> and I and well, I'm not planning on going anywhere. Nobody so plans. You're pretty the, safe. Uh, these things just happen. But, yeah, they do. <laughs> and uh, our producer Jinx is in his little glass booth. He's the type of friend who was probably involved with your getting in jail. <laughs> <laughs> and our one-man IT department, John Myers, is in the tech bunker. John says a good friend will help you bury the body, but a great friend will help you manage the cables. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George says Facebook is essentially the iron lung of friendship. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Kathy Wyatt, uh, saw feminine side of the program here, and she is indeed a friend of Key Life and us too. Well, that was nice. I know. I was, it was waiting nice. for the I kicker. Was, it no, felt there was no to kicker. Me. It was just going to no, be you're a the... nice. <laughs> Well, but you don't write them. Say them. That's yeah. right. Matthew writes the, them, so right. I was waiting for the kicker. kicker. <laughs> not the kicker. And when they're good, I take credit. And when they're bad, he gets the credit. <laughs> that is How true. Works. This you works, man. I'll tell you. <laughs> we have a great guest, and he's one of our favorite. He's been on several times. A lot of our guests refuse to come back, but Jared... Uh, has hadn't learned uh, the thing. said yeah, yeah hadn't <laughs> learned the thing. <laughs> he serves as assistant professor of pastoral ministry and author in residence at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. As I've said on numerous occasions, uh, Baptists are like weeds; they're everywhere, and you can't get rid of them. He's a pastor and director of the Pastoral Training Center at Liberty Baptist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. He's also an award-winning author, and he's written more than 20 books. Every time he burps, they publish it. And his newest book, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, is titled Friendship with a Friend of Sinners. The remarkable possibility of closeness with Christ. Jared, thanks for being with us. We appreciate that. Thank you, Steve. Do you know um, it's been over 10 years I've been showing up on, on your program. You've been kind enough to have me on. Wow. My, huh. my first time was when I was in, in Vermont, which was about 10 years or so ago. So That's right. Oh, well, yeah. happy oh, anniversary. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, 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 it's anything. What, <laughs> what is the 10-year anniversary? It's, well, I don't know if today is the 10-year or, anniversary. But it's 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 champagne or something, something, <laughs> something to, bring, <laughs> to bring. Kathy Jer should make cupcakes. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Jared and I uh, were talking kicker, before the, the program, and uh, I say, you know, he's he. He's kind of, well, I hate the word authentic, but authentic and stupid works. <laughs> if you, uh, I mean, he says things that you ought not put in a book about himself. And I told him that uh, I have the same stuff. I'm just not going to tell people in a book. And he said, no, that would be multi-volumes. <laughs> I get no respect from anybody around here. What does it mean to be a friend with Jesus? Does that mean we get him off the altar 
and out of the liturgy and away from the formality of a worship service and have a beer with him? <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I'm now a half second away from getting in trouble with my employers. So <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this is a record, a show record for me. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I I don't think it means um, no pushing Christ out of our liturgy and out of the you know out of the formal worship service. Um, like a lot of you know folks of, of my generation, at least, and I think maybe even before that, I grew up hearing the cliche. Uh, that Christianity is not a religion; it's a it's a relationship. I don't know you, you've heard that, right? Oh, only uh, eight billion times. Right? Yeah, and 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 I I really believed it and took it to heart, but no one really ever explained what that meant. What what it turned out was I'd sort of traded one version of Christianity where Jesus was just kind of an idea. I had a relationship with the idea of Jesus when I was into the kind of religiosity thing. But then the the relationship idea that I was sort of discipled in was really just another version of being in a relationship with Jesus as an idea. And what I'm trying to do in the book is is really something I've I've had to work out in my own devotional life over the last you know number of years, which is to remember that Jesus is a real person, that he's not you know he's not an idea, he's not uh, a vague force or or something like that. Uh, but he but but he's a real person, and and so to remember that when I'm when I'm reading his his words and when I'm you know praying to him, um, and so, so that's what, you know really what I'm getting at. Um, whether yeah. you can have a beer with Jesus or or not uh, <laughs> is probably up to your palate. But uh, I'm a, I'm a he is the kind of person who could have a beer. I guess is what I'm, saying. <laughs> I'm a teetotaler, and uh, I was I just got back from the Cove, the Graham Training Center in oh, yeah. North Carolina. I go up there fairly often, and in the early days, I went with Richard Pratt. <laughs> and they would put us in a really nice hotel, the Grove Park Inn, and then we'd have the the sessions in in the chapel at the Cove. Now, they've built hotels, and there's a conference center, and it's a magnificent place. But in the early days, it was pretty minimal. And Richard and I were having dinner, and he said, uh, you know what I would like? And I said, no, Richard, what would you like? He said, I would like a beer. He said, but I can't put a beer on Billy Graham's tab. <laughs> and I said, listen, he thinks I drink, so put it on my tab and it'll pass. <laughs> so they, I, I didn't drink it, but he drank the beer and I put it on my tab and nobody said anything because they expected that if I weren't drinking, I'd be a drunk. And uh, so at any rate. Uh, John fifteen fifteen. That's a great text, and we kind of skip over it. And he said, "You're my friends." Yeah, I, I want to take that text as seriously as as possible. I think many times we we kind of jump ahead, or at least I have in my life, we jump ahead to sort of you know Paul's language about um, you know being a bond servant of mm. Christ and. And certainly Jesus is our master. We are disciples of him, and, and he is God, so we obey him and honor him and submit to him. And yet Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, to his disciples, says, I, I don't call you servants. I, I call you friends. And th that just revolutionizes, uh, for me, um, my understanding of his disposition towards me. Um, I, I think it's right to think of myself as one who is um, you know, subservient or submissive to Jesus, and yet he doesn't treat me like an employer-employee relationship or master-servant relationship. He he treats me as a good older brother or or as as a friend, as he says there. And so I just want to take him, you know, at his word that he calls us friends. Um, you know, the book of Hebrews says he's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. I want, I want to believe Jesus when he says that and then just try to tease out as much of what that means as as possible. What kind of friend is Jesus? That's the kind of question I'm trying to answer. Um, you know, it, yeah. is he like us? Is he not like us? Is he a good friend? If he's a good friend, how good a friend is he? Is he going to bail you out of jail? <laughs> or is he going to go like, I knew that guy was like that, you know? <laughs> Did you, uh, you had uh, 
And we maybe won't have time to tell the whole story before we get into the break, but we'll do it on the other side. But you can start it. You had okay. kind of a personal experience that radically changed you, didn't you? I did. Yeah, it was a guest bedroom of our home in Nashville, Tennessee, about 20 or so years ago. And um, I was at the end of my rope and, um, you know, depressed, d full of despair, suicidal, the whole the whole thing. And um, my experience of of the spirit of Christ, just one fateful night, just praying my guts out, crying into the carpet of the floor. Um, it upended everything that I had thought about how God thought of me and how Christ relates to me. And that's been, you know, all of my ministry since then has been in the wake, really, of that experience. You know, I had an experience like that, too, similar, when I uh, was so depressed and told God, I don't like what I'm doing. I, I'm tired all the time. I don't like these people. I want to get out of it. I got to do it until I die. And uh, I'd rather die. And that was an experience of friendship, too. He came. He yep. said, you don't have to do this anymore. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, you're free. And the next morning, I resigned. And now, I'm a spiritual giant. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, that and other lies when we come back. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Joining us, uh, we're hanging out with Jared Wilson, and his uh, latest book is titled Friendship with the Friend of Sinners, The Remarkable Possibility of Closeness with Christ. I love that title. I, you know, when you say friends with Jesus, everybody that's been in the church and sung those songs when they were children say, but of course. But the addition, Friendship with the Friend of Sinners, suggests that Jesus hangs out in some pretty low places. Jared, you, uh, before the break, you were talking about, there was an experience which was, uh, in, in some ways, the one that defined your life. Things had fallen apart. You said you were suicidal, ready to jump off a bridge, and uh, had been crying out to God on the floor for weeks, and then something happened. What was that? Yeah, it, it, the buildup for this, just to kind of take a step back, really was kind of the the rotten fruit of of a, a long pattern of sin in my life that had, um, you know, poisoned my marriage and 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 everything else. So, you know, I was married, but we were, you know, living like roommates in in our home and. Um, you know, uh, I knew I had lost my wife's heart and, you know, she had brought up the idea of divorce before. And I mean, I, I had really crushed her spirit with, with my, uh, with my life, with my behavior. And were you, you a know, pastor, the were you a I, pastor sort of, at the time? Were you, no, a no, I was actually out of ministry at the time, okay. which I, you know, looking back, I realized was really the Lord's kindness. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand that. That was actually one of my um, one of my hurts was that I believe the Lord had called me into ministry. I, I had been in ministry before, in vocational ministry before, and at this time was out. And you know, I wasn't qualified, um, but but I didn't really even have that category, that you know, that language, yeah. the kind of churches I had, you know, been trained for didn't really you know prepare me for that kind of thing. I didn't know about the qualifications for you know eldership and those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, so about a year, um, you know, living in, in the guest bedroom of our home and, um, just kind of walking through life, either really numb or really sensitive, you know, hypersensitive to everything, just kind of this wave of, of raw nerves or just, you know, kind of, uh, white noise in my brain. And I, I just thought, you know, this is not the life that, I thought I was going to have this, not the life I wanted. I, I've ruined everybody's life. 
Um, I can't talk to anybody about this. You know, I talk a little bit in the book just about, um, you know, feeling so lonely you could die, uh, which I think is probably a more common feeling than a lot of people are willing to admit. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I felt so alone um, that I wish that I could just die. And I also thought this would be a blessing if I, if I kill myself. Um, I've ruined my wife's life. Now I would make it better if I was gone because, you know, depression, you know, um, plays, um, it plays with your mind. It, it, it's like a funhouse mirror. It distorts things. And, and so I'm hearing, you know, the whisper of the enemy about how this would be a good thing. And I'm thinking about it constantly. And every night I'm begging God to give me some reason to keep going or just to fix it. Lots of prayers for, for some kind of miracle, for something that, that I, yeah. I know is beyond my ability. And one night, um, just like any other night, I you know was asking God to fix it. And something different happened. Something, I mean, I, I'm not a charismatic you know, guy, but that there was a supernatural experience of the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart not anything I hadn't heard before. Um, it was a message that I had heard countless times growing up in churches, but it was as if, you know, I heard it as if for the first time. Mm. And it was basically just the message of the gospel. You know, Steve, like I didn't know the gospel was for Christians. Mm. Um, I thought the gospel was just for lost people. And then, you know, once you have it, you move on to deeper things and better things. And I learned that night before I knew anything about gospel-centered you know, whatever, I, you know, I didn't know about podcasts or conferences or, uh, you know, any kind of tribe or anything like that, uh, any kind of movement happening. Um, it was me wanting to kill myself and the Lord coming near to me and sitting by my side and saying, I love you. I, re I remember the exact words. It was not an audible voice, but the, the alien thought mm -hmm. that I believe is from the Holy Spirit came into my head, which was, I love you and I approve of you. Mm -hmm. And that was like someone had drawn up the shades and sun was now coming into this darkened room because I was at my lowest, my worst. I was utterly unapprovable. And to hear, to believe that the holy God of the universe approves of me and would come near to me, it changed everything for me. And it was such a profound experience in my life that I continue to go back to it. It's sort of the epicenter of all of my ministry since then, all of my writing since then, and certainly this book as, as well. Jesus is the friend who, when you have nothing left and nothing to offer and nobody wants to be around you, or at least you think that, he comes and, and puts his arm around you and sits right down with you in that pigsty. That's the kind of friend Jesus is. Oh, man. You know, I I really believe that most Christians uh, don't identify with what you just said. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've layered this thing with so many um, admonishments and places you ought to be convicted. And repentance means changing, and you've got to repent right now. And if you do, God will notice, and everything will be fine. It's all bull. It's not true, and it's not what the Bible teaches. And so what you discovered is the Christian faith. And uh, that speaking of God's Spirit to you at that point, that was him. And, uh, and he would speak the same thing to everybody who's listening. People get angry at Key Life because our logo always says God is not mad at you. Most people think he is and think he ought to be, and if he's not, he should be. And in this book and in the gospel, so the read the Bible and this book the same because they're saying the same thing, uh, that Jesus is a friend, not of the righteous and the good and the pure and the obedient. Nobody is that. He's a friend with uh, friendship, with the friend of sinners. How about that? That's a pleasant thought. <laughs> I'm glad it changed you because you probably were a jerk. You were <laughs> you were driving a truck, weren't you? Driving a truck? Yeah. Yeah. At that time, I probably was. Yeah. What? Why do you say that, though? Because I thought I remembered you saying that 10 years ago. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was a little and silver trap. And I've truck. always thought that's what I'd like <laughs> a to A mind do. like a steel trap. How that's did right. you remember <laughs> that? Oh, well, because I always wanted to drive a truck. Well, yeah. He's been that. saving that for your 10-year anniversary. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, we're talking with uh, Jared Wilson. And, you, you know, you say, I know all this. I don't, I don't need to read. Yeah, you do. Get this book because this puts legs on the reality that is the center message of the book. Jesus likes crazy ragamuffin failures, people who are sinners, because that's all he's got. Uh, So get the book. Form a small group and study it. Give it to your friends and say to them, put this in your pipe and smoke it. is friendship with a friend of sinners the remarkable possibility of closeness with christ you can keep up with jared at jared c wilson what does the c stand for it stands for coy was my grandfather's name coy c-o-y Jared, but don't put Coy in because you won't get him. It's jaredcwilson.com and on Twitter and Instagram at Jared C. Wilson. Jared, you know, you talked about the John 15, 15, and there's different ways of understanding our relationship with Christ. And, you know, the slave master, I think we can get that because you're like, right, look, I'm just lucky to get in the door. I'm just going to keep my head down, work really, really hard because I don't even deserve this. I can, uh, at least personally, I can wrap my head around that. You're like, yeah, just thanks. Hey, thanks for letting me be on the team. But the thing of friendship, it, we have, it, it's an it's a added level of challenge for us to really fully embrace that. Why is that why what is the specific thing and i know we have a problem with it because you wrote a book to address it (laughs) why why do we resist that invitation from him yeah i i think you know the large portion of it is a spiritual issue which is just that our our flesh yearns for law um our, our our brain understands because of the world we we live in and 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 the environments that we swim in that performance and and production and earning and merit is just how things work, right? You know, quote, unquote, this is just how things work. I do a good job. I get a good grade. I do a good job. I get a raise, what have you. But then just internally, I I think it just makes sense to our, our, our fleshly bent that the way God would relate to us is as someone who is withholding his approval until we achieve certain things for him or perform a certain way. And so to orient around, you know, the fullness of, of the good news to really see the news is actually good and and not business as usual. I think it, it just takes a, a serious um, recalibration. It takes um, in, in a way, I mean, the repentance that we need is actually to repent of our works, righteousness, to repent of this, this idea that, you know, God is holding out on us, this idea that we're kind of earning credit with him and actually humble ourselves enough to say that this is all of grace, um, that he really does come near to us. He really does clothe us in his righteousness. Um, you know, before the before the break, Steve was talking about, you know, um, the, the, the uh, response that you get to saying God's not mad at you. I remember when a, um, a member of my church came up to me after my sermon, and and he said, "You know, Jared, God's never disappointed in you." And it just took me aback and thought, "Well, you know, what heresy is this?" <laughs> because <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I lived, I've lived all of my life feeling like God was disappointed in me, um, and 
you know, and as he sort of explained it out, I, you know, in the moment I wasn't totally believing it, but he said to imply that God is, um, you know, disappointed in you is to suggest somehow he's surprised by you or, you know, that he <laughs> is surprised by the kind of person you are or the things that you would do. And I thought, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And it take, you know, it's taken a while for that to settle in with me. Oh, yeah. Um, and in my in my more unguarded moments, I, I struggle to believe it. But when I'm really looking at his word and seeing what he is saying about me and about himself in relation to me, um, I I I really believe he's not he's not angry. The wrath has been satisfied by Christ totally at the cross. And not only that, he's not even disappointed in in me. I'm I'm as big a dirtbag as he knew I was. <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing I can do to where he would say, I had no idea you were like this. Right? Yeah. I, I thought you were an asset to the organization. <laughs> Clearly, I you know. So you fulfilled no, he, your he potential. Knows I'm a liability, and he's brought me on because of that. You know. Mm. You know, I was speaking at a conference one time and had a Q and A at the end, and I've been saying God's not angry at you you're a believer and the first guy said and was quite angry with me and said i think you're wrong he is angry at me and he said and i'm glad mm. and i said in my pastoral way sir you're a fruitcake there's something mm. wrong with you you <laughs> you're kind of weird he said no that's what keeps me straight is the awareness that mm. jesus is ticked there's a fear that if he wasn't disappointed then would I even have a motivation yeah. to go further? It's like, yeah, a better one, healthier one, biblical mm -hmm. one. And the only one that works, by the way, because I've done it both ways. I, you know, I'm old. There isn't anything you've tried I haven't tried <laughs> several times. And I've done the rule thing and uh, fairly good at faking it. But I knew at night when I would go to bed that it's, that's exactly what it was. And I was in serious trouble. Because God is big and scary. In fact, if you never stood before God and been afraid, <clears throat> you're worshiping an idol. But if you've never stood before God and been loved and you knew you didn't deserve it, you're worshiping an idol too. And you got to get this book. It's, uh, it's so good by Jared Wilson. Friendship with the Friend of Sinners, the Remarkable Possibility of Closeness with Christ. And if you're sitting there and you're saying what my dumb friend said, he's angry and I'm glad, don't you touch this dial. You need everything we're going to say on the other side of the break. And if you turn it off, you'll get the fever and die. By the way, if you haven't yet subscribed to the weekly Key Life email, uh, you're making Jared sad. <laughs> I mean, Jesus isn't, but Jared would prefer that you did. He's just too nice to say it. So while you're thinking about it, go to keylife.org slash subscribe. And the great thing about it is it's absolutely free. So if you complain, we'll just ignore you. <laughs> Jared, um, you you reference it uh, being made in the image of God. We're made the Trinity. We're made for relationship as a part of that. Um, and then when you were talking about uh, you know our our flesh um, is drawn to uh, the law and compliance with the law, you also mentioned that our our flesh is drawn to uh, the physical, the idolatry. Uh, idols and so forth. And then you made a statement that um, it's to our advantage at this time that Jesus is invisible. Um, can you kind of expand on that? What what did you mean with that, to our advantage that Jesus is invisible? Yeah, well, I think 
uh, you know, that's me sort of drawing from Jesus's own words to his disciples who, um, you know, they just got him back. He had, he had just been resurrected and he's preparing them for his ascension. So he's about to go away again. And, you know, obviously they're, um, you know, concerned about that or upset about that, sad about that. And he basically says to them, it's actually to your advantage that I do this because I will send the comforter to you. I'll send the Holy Spirit. Um, my friend J.D. Greer kind of says that, um, you know, the the spirit inside you is better than the Jesus you, 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 uh, beside you. And the reason is because Jesus at that time, of course, um, incarnate, takes up time and space. He can't be with everyone. Um, you know, he is omn omnipresent as the son of God. And so someday I, I assume this math is going to get worked out in the new heavens and new earth. Where he's, the, <laughs> he's the illumination of all creation. But in the meantime, he says, it's better that I send the Holy Spirit who can indwell every believer. And that is the spirit of Christ now present with all of us. If If it was like when he was here in his first coming, he has, um, you know, he's limited by that time and space, uh, you know, by his own his own volition. And, you know, there are people, I assume, that wanted his healing who who couldn't get it or people who wanted his ear and couldn't have it. And yet because of the of the presence of the Holy Spirit, you know, given as a gift at, at Pentecost, um, we at any time, at any given moment uh, can talk to Jesus at we at any given moment. Um, you know, can relate to him and and know because of his promise in in his word that um, he is closer than we feel he is. You know, there are are you know numerous times, uh, if not most times, where I do not feel close to Jesus. You know, when I when I talk about feeling close to Jesus, it's usually some special moment, maybe in a worship service or just in my own devotional life. So I don't, you know, most of the time feel close to him. And yet, because I know I'm united with him by faith and seated with him in the heavenly places and hidden with him in God, Paul says, then he is closer than my, you know, my next breath. He He's closer than I feel that he is. Um, so that's kind of what I'm getting at there is just to say that this friend is, um, he's even closer than the friend who who sticks closer than a brother. He's um, you know, he's never far from us. We are always in his hand. Jared, when I first picked up the book and I was looking through the the various chapters, um, I uh, honed in on chapter eight because I love the title, which is, and the kitchen sink, um, <laughs> which I thought, I like this title. You know, I can remember as a kid growing up, you know, my mother using that, everything but the kitchen sink, you know, and it was never anything that was a terribly positive comment. But anyway, but underneath that, it says Jesus, the generous friend. So I thought, okay, there's going to be something really good in here. So as I was reading through it, I got to uh, their specific, as you know, you're the writer, um, there are specific sections in there. And the one that stuck out at me uh, was the one that's titled "What He Receives," in other words, what Jesus receives from fr from friendship with us. And I was just as I was thinking, as I was reading through it, and you were talking some about the disciples and their failures, and you know Jesus never turning his back on them, and you know, and then you think about yourself and individual and your failures and everything, and and I was really struck by what what does he get out of friendship with me or or any of us could you just elaborate on that a little bit cuz that's that's just yeah that's a tough one <laughs> for me anyway <laughs> yeah well you know theologically speaking there's nothing we contribute or add to him he exactly. doesn't need anything from us um, what I'm trying to do in, in that section is talk about a couple of things. Number one, that if 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 Jesus were not were not God and could not be changed, you know, um, if he were able to be changed, I guess you should say, if, if he were not immutable and 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 so on and so forth, um, he would be getting the raw end of this deal <laughs> at every exactly. moment, right? I mean, yes. In the great in the great exchange, we receive, yeah. you know, the fullness of his grace, the riches of his grace, his righteousness. He receives our sin. <laughs> our complaints, our our baggage, our brokenness, he receives all of that. So, you know, he's getting the raw end of it. Um, but the other thing, you know, that I try to tease out there is um, really connected to that, that concept we were talking about earlier, the difference between kind of a servant spirituality and a friendship spirituality 
how does Jesus actually receive or regard our efforts um, as sinful, as as messed up as we are, um, when we try to do good things for him and we're we're we we are obeying him and um and under a servant spirituality, we think we're earning, you know, things with him or we're earning credit with him or making him more favorable towards us in some way. Under a, a friendship spirituality, what what we understand is that there's there's nothing that um, we can do to make him better or bigger or more glorious, and yet he receives all of these stupid, meager efforts as if they are riches themselves. And the illustration I use is kind of like when you have a you know a small child who, you know your your little son or daughter is playing out in the yard, and um, you know they come inside with a handful of weeds that they have pulled up. You know, and they give it to you like they're giving you some kind of bouquet, right? <laughs> um, or or they've drawn some, you know, messy, disorganized, who knows what this is, Rorschach, you know, <laughs> in blood of a, a a work of art, and they give it to you. What do you do, right, when when they do that? You don't say, you idiot, these are weeds, <laughs> right? <You> say, <laughs> these aren't flowers. Are you some kind of moron, you know? <laughs> or like, what even is this piece of art? You know, it's a piece of junk. No, we don't do that. We take those weeds, we put them in a vase, we put you know water in there, we put it up on the counter, and we say, oh, thank you so much. This is so sweet. We take that stupid artwork and we put it up on the refrigerator. We put the you know magnets in there. I've even got one framed. I have no idea what the drawing is, but <laughs> my daughter did when she was little. Yep. And I thought, this looks kind of cool. I framed it, put it in my office. She said it's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the Lord, I think, treats our efforts. Oh, man. Jared, you are such a Benedictine. Uh, We love you. We love the books uh, that you write. And we love having you as our guest. I hope you'll continue to go against your better nature and return uh, with (laughs) us on Steve Brown, etc. Jared, God bless you. We rise up and call you blessed. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Guys, we're going to come back. Don't go. because uh, he gets it, and he gets it profoundly. And uh, he's not building an empire. He's not trying to get you to think well of him. He's simply overwhelmed with the grace of God, and it blows him away, and he can't stop talking about it. And thank heavens, he talks and writes well. You know, the bottom line, my, my father uh, taught me a lot of things. My father was a drunk. Uh, he did a lot of bad things. Uh, he uh, uh, he was also a pool shark, very good. Uh, the best in our hometown when he was sober and the second best when he was drunk. <laughs> but you know, and my brother and I talked about it a lot, uh, our father loved us with such passion, uh, s- such depth, that it was embarrassing sometimes. I mean, he he always had his pic- our pictures with him, and he showed them to anybody who would look. Uh, he couldn't. He didn't think there was a party uh, if we weren't there. Uh, he was touching. Uh, we kissed in our family with my father, even if he smelled like booze. My fondest memories are sitting on the front porch and watching thunderstorms come across the mountains, and he absolutely loved those kinds of things. And then, you know, even when I stole cherry pies from the supermarket, others said, "My da- if Dad finds out, I'm history. And I thought, my father finds out, he'll love me, and that's a lot worse. And then I read where the Scripture says, if you then being evil... Uh, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father in heaven. And I thought, oh, man, I've got it made in the shade. 
I mean, if God loves me one-tenth as much as my biological father, I'm set for life. And then I found out a lot more than my father. And that's what Jared's been talking about. you got to get this book, uh, Friendship with the Friend of Sinner. Read it for your devotional. It'll make your day. All right, who's going to be on next week? Well, I think I announced this a couple of weeks ago, and it didn't work out. But this time, it's really working out. Um, next week is Craig Hefner, um, who wrote a book called Kierkegaard and the Changelessness of God. And I was excited to book that interview because I've heard about, I never heard about Kierkegaard till I went to work for you. <laughs> and now I've heard nothing but Kierkegaard for years. <laughs> so you don't want to miss. Don't want to miss it. And if you say... I don't know who you're talking about. You need to be here next week. And we'll hope that you will be. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide (laughs) berth. (laughs) Jinx is going like this. (laughs) And he... And he doesn't mean make it last longer. Yeah, right. (laughs)